Uh, Alan is a neighbor of mine, lives on the next block, and I saw in the paper about uh, him going to speak at the Port Washington uh, Historical Society about a year ago, and I said, you know, this is kind of interesting. I don't know much about the Italian-Austrian front of World War I. Very few people do. And Alan came to speak, and I went there and heard his outstanding presentation, and I talked to him, and I said, Alan, you've got to come talk to my club sometime, and he agreed to do that. So without further ado, Dr. Alan Boswick from Port Washington, take Thank us you. back to World War I and what it was like, what you saw. You've got an excellent presentation. The night is yours. Let's welcome him. Thank you very much, and uh, it's an honor for me to be here. And I have to tell you that when Ken came up to me after the Historical Society presentation, he said he wanted a little bit more of a military emphasis to my talk, because the talk I gave was pretty social. So I said, Ken, I'm going to need to go back to Slovenia and get more information. And uh, he was very generous. He offered the financial support of your group uh, for my trip. And uh, thank you very much, Ken. And I want to let you know I had a great time when I was there. So. Anyway, we're going to start, and uh, the first thing I'm going to do is take care of a little housekeeping here because there's always a lot of confusion between Slovenia and Slovakia. And uh, Slovenia, the small uh, country here in the red, uh, was one of the... Helen, you need to keep the mic up by your chest. Okay. Um, Slovenia was one of the seven Yugoslav republics. Um, that when the uh, Yugoslavia broke up, it became an independent nation in um, 1991. It's a small country about the size of New Jersey. It has a population of about 2 million people. And you can see it's bordered by Italy, Austria, Hungary, and Croatia. And uh, in comparison, this is Slovakia. And I can't tell you how many times people think I'm talking about Slovakia when I'm talking about Slovenia. Slovakia became an independent nation in 1993, almost about the same time. It's almost about the same size, and it borders Austria and Hungary. Now, um, the reason I'm uh, talking about Slovenia and my interest in Slovenia is that my mother was 100% Slovenian. Oh, so, so much for the pointer. Um, but anyway, um, she never had a chance to go back to Slovenia. So in 2006, I, had, I took a little time off of work and decided to go to Slovenia and see what it was all about. And uh, during that first visit, I was able to connect up with some relatives. And since 2006, I've made 15 trips back to Slovenia uh, to visit family and to hike in the mountains. And when I was there in... Um, 2015, uh, two of my cousins on a Sunday afternoon took me to some World War I battle sites. One was in Italy and one was in Slovenia. And I was fascinated by what I saw and I said, I need to come back here sometime. So when I was there in 2017, my daughter Allison came with me on that visit. Um, are we okay there? Okay. I just need to move it once in a while. So in 2017, um, when I was there, my cousin Marco and his family gave me this book. And it's called The Walk of Peace, uh, From the Alps to the Adriatic. And um, I took that as a challenge from my cousin Marco because he hikes in the mountains every weekend. And I think he was looking at me as kind of being soft and uh, not in very good shape. And so I took the book home. And I read it, and I said, you know what, I can do this. And so I started training for this uh, walk of peace uh, in the summer of 2018. And then in September, I headed off to Slovenia. Uh, the name of the walk of peace is Pot Maru. Pot is a Slovenian term for walk, and Mir is a Slovenian term for peace. So walk of peace. And I did this from September 10th to the September 28th. And this walk, as I said, took me from the Alps. And I started my walk on the northeast or northwest border of uh, Slovenia in Italy and walked across the uh, Julian Alps 
uh, all the way to the Adriatic Sea uh, by Trieste, Italy. Inside the, the front cover of this book is this quotation. And it was written by Dr. Julius Kugi. It was from his essay, My War in July. And Dr. Kugi uh, was originally from this area. Uh, he was a mountaineer, a botanist, a teacher, a musician, and a lawyer. Quite a combination. But in 1915, he became a soldier for the Austro-Hungarian Army. And he wrote, uh, the war is still raging, nevertheless peace will eventually bless all the valleys and the old heavenly tranquility will mercifully reign over the mountains again. We shall visit the graves then and pay homage to our dead heroes. So in essence, Dr. Kugi wrote the mission statement for Pope Maru. A brief review of the history of World War I, and I'll go through this quickly. Um, also called the Great War and the War to End All Wars. Uh, everything got started on June 28, 1914, when the heir apparent to the Austrian-Hungarian Austria throne, uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie, they traveled to Sarajevo in Bosnia to inspect the troops. It was there on that day that they were assassinated by a Bosnian uh, Serb nationalist. His name was Gavrilo Princip. And I don't have time to talk about the assassination attempt today, but if you really want to be entertained um, and uh, see what a fiasco that um, assassination attempt was, I recommend you just Google the assassination of Franz Ferdinand uh, and look at the uh, Wikipedia site. It's really uh, quite entertaining. So about one month after uh, the assassination, um, Austria-Hungary um, declared war on Serbia. Austria-Hungary had the support of Germany in doing that. Uh, then uh, Serbia uh, gained the support of, uh, of the Russians, uh, anticipating a war. Uh, then Germany, uh, with the support of um, the Ottoman Empire, uh, declared war on Russia, creating the Eastern Front, and um, then simultaneously declared war on France and Belgium, creating the Western Front. Uh, two days after Germany declared war on those areas, the United Kingdom declared war on Germany. Now, Italy um, were, it was more closely aligned to Germany and Austria-Hungary before the war. But Italy always wanted to expand its northern border so that it would get control of the seaport at Trieste. Uh, at that time, and still is, Trieste is the largest seaport on the Adriatic, and it was vital for getting goods into Eastern Europe. So um, prior to, uh, there was, you know, Italy wanted to remain neutral, but they were enticed to enter the war by France and Great Britain because they promised them an expansion of their northern border if they entered the war against Austria-Hungary. So on May 23rd, about one month after that uh, secret treaty of London, Italy declared war on Austria-Hungary, and that created the Southwest Front. Now the Southwest Front ran all the way across the border of Italy and um, Austria-Hungary, and that was about 600 kilometers total length. The Azanzo Front, which I'm gonna talk about tonight, that was the easternmost part of the uh, Southwest Front, the last 90 kilometers, or uh, 56 miles. And that went along the Asanzo River or the Socha River. The name for this river is Asanzo if you're talking Italian. If you're speaking Slovenian, it's the Socha. So hopefully I don't confuse you during the night here if I interchange those names. But whether I say a Socha River or Asanzo River, I'm talking basically about the same river. And over a period of 29 months, there were 12 Azanzo battles. Um, the Italians initiated the first 11. The Austro-Hungarians and German uh, uh, initiated the 12th. And just as a reference point, the United States entered the war on April 6, 1917, when they declared war on Germany. Now eventually, uh, the Italians defeated Austria-Hungary uh, in early November of uh, 1917. 
and the armistice was signed by Austria-Hungary on November 3rd, just eight days before Germany signed the armistice that we just celebrated um, on November 11th. The casualties on the Isonzo front, and you have to remember, this is just a 90 kilometer or roughly 60 mile segment. Uh, they were uh, very high. Um, they were staggering. Uh, the Italian army uh, had 300,000 deaths and 700,000 wounded. The Austro-Hungarian army, 200,000 deaths, 30,000 of which were uh, ethnic Slovenes, and there were uh, 300,000 wounded. Now, on the entire southwest front between Italy and Austria-Hungary, there were 600 deaths. So at least half of those uh, deaths occurred on this uh, Asanzo front. This is a map of Europe, um, basically in 1915. And in the mustard yellow, these are the central powers. Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, which included Bulgaria at the time. And the allies in the green were Russia, Great Britain, France, Italy, in this Serbia right here, the one that started it all, kind of. But if you look at this map, you can see this border of Italy here kind of ends right at the top in this bay. And what they really wanted, they wanted to get down onto this peninsula. This is the Isonzo uh, River, or the um, Socha, however you want to call it, in the blue. And um, this territory between the blue and the Red X's was all part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire before the war. The Red X's were the border between Italy and Austria-Hungary. And, um, and again on this map, you can see Trieste is over here, uh, well within the border of Austria-Hungary. Now, when it came time, when war became imminent, the Austro-Hungarians had to decide where they were going to set up their defense. Were they going to set it up on the border? Were they going to set it up on this uh, bank of the Azanzo, Or were they going to set it up further in um, Slovenia along the Sava River? They made the decision to set it up here. And that made some sense. Um, and, and they conceded this area here to the Italians at the start of the war. I think they felt that if they set up here and were pushed back, they'd be pushed back against mountains. And if they got pushed back even further, they'd be pushed back into the river valley. And if they got pushed back further, they'd have their backs to the mountains even more. So I think uh, they felt that the best place to set up was along in the mountains on this shore or this bank of the Asanzo River. Now, the other th thing I'm going to mention is, and to make an analogy to a football game, um, if the Asanzo River was the 50-yard line, the majority of this war, especially in the upper Asanzo area, uh, was really fought between the 45s. It was just a, a very narrow uh, war area. You know, it, uh, so um, basically, it went maybe five kilometers this way and five kilometers that way uh, from the Asanzo. This is the map of Europe after war, uh, the war, and you can see uh, how things have changed. First of all, in Italy, they now have possession of this territory that they wanted, including Trieste. France is about the same. Great Britain is the same. Germany is a little bit smaller. Um, Russia is smaller, and because, and the reason for that is, Poland appears on the map after the war. Actually, Polish Independence Day is November 11th, 1918. So they gained their independence the day the armistice was signed. Um, the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire was dissolved, and it was broken up into independent republics of Austria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania. And it shows on this map Yugoslavia. But Yugoslavia didn't become a, an entity by itself until the early 1920s. Right after the war, it was known as the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slavs. Or Slovenes, I'm sorry. So when I first went to Slovenia uh, that year, I went to the city of Kovarid. And Kovarid seems to be the center point of the Azanzo Front. And uh, as I go along, you'll understand why. I did visit the office of uh, Pope Maru. And um, 
they were very helpful. Now, the, the function of Pope Moreau, it's actually a collaboration between Slovenia and Italy, and the purpose of the organization and the walk is to honor and memorialize the lives that were uh, transformed and lost uh, on the Azanzo front in World War I. Uh, right across the street from their office um, is the wonderful World War I Museum in Kovarid. Uh, and I spent most of my morning there. I had visited that museum one other time with one of my cousins over there. And part of that museum is dedicated to this man, Ernest Hemingway. Uh, Ernest Hemingway um, was an American. He volunteered with the Italian Army uh, early in the war. Uh, he was an ambulance driver. Uh, for the Italian army, and he was injured in his service. He was serving a little bit east of Kobarid, but he recovered in the hospital uh, in Kobarid, and then Kobarid became the setting um, for his famous novel, A Farewell to Arms. It's also been made into a movie at least a couple times. This one with Rock Hudson, Jennifer Jones, and you can see his ambulance flying from a, a mortar that hit. Um, you can see the the mountains in the background, and uh, you can see him getting a nice massage from Jennifer Jones. And you see the priest here looking on, wondering what's going on. So, <laughs> so after I um, was finished at the museum that day, on a hill above the, uh, Cobra Reed uh, is uh, this facility here, or this built monument here. These are the Alps in the background. Um, this is the Italian charnel house in Kobarid. A charnel house is basically a large uh, mausoleum. And in the center of this is the Church of St. Anthony, uh, which was built in 1696. And surrounding it is this charnel house. And this uh, contains the remains of 7,000 Italian soldiers uh, that were killed in the Kobarid and Bovic area. Um, and this uh, structure dedicated in 1938 by none other than Benito Mussolini, who was then the fascist dictator of uh, Italy. Another place I want to talk to before I start talking about my walk, and uh, this was very important to the Austro-Hungarian um, effort, this was the Versich uh, Pass, and this is a, a chapel that was built by the um, uh, Russian POWs. As I, as I mentioned earlier, the war on the Eastern Front started about nine months prior to fighting on the Southwest Front. By already, the Austro-Hungarians had taken at least 12,000 Russian POWs, and they brought them to uh, Slovenia, to the Versich area, to build a road. Um, there was already a road there, but it was very rudimentary, not big enough to transport troops or equipment. So. Um, they employed these uh, Russian POWs uh, to build this road over the Versich Pass, which is the highest pass in the Eastern Alps. And uh, in the process of doing that, the Russians sustained uh, 400 plus casualties in building that road. And uh, 200 of them were killed in an avalanche that occurred in February of 1916. So they started the road in May of 1915 and actually finished it in April of 1916. I was going to also tell you that uh, part of the problem building that road, and I've driven over it a couple times, is that there's 50 switchbacks, uh, 24 going up and 26 coming down. So now it was time for me to walk the walk. This is something I trained for all summer, and uh, the walk of peace starts in this uh, little community here. It's called Logpad Mangarten, and um, Lokpart Mangatan during the war was known uh, specifically for two things. Uh, the first is it was the site of the first and only mosque in all of Slovenia. And the reason there was a mosque in Slovenia was because of these soldiers here. Um, these are uh, the Bosniak soldiers. Um, they came from uh, uh, Bosnia. And uh, they were thought to be the most fierce fighters of all the troops in the Austro-Hungarian army. Uh, the other uh, thing that's uh, in um, Lokpan Mangarten is the Stolm. And uh, 
this is exactly where I started my walk, standing right here, and then the trail took off behind uh, into the mountains behind here. But the stall that was initially a tunnel uh, for a lead mine, uh, it drained water out of a lead mine. Um, but with the advent of the war, the Austro-Hungarians converted it to a transportation route. It ran through the mountain. It was uh, five kilometers or three miles long, and uh, they used this to transport troops and supplies uh, to the front. You know, I, I mentioned that my, uh, I started the walk in Lodpad Mangatan, and the day my cousin drove me up there to start the walk, we were driving up hill all the way, and I'm thinking, you know, this is going to be an easy day of walking. It's just going to be all downhill. But uh, in this area, um, along the Azanzo Front, uh, all the battle sites, all the history, the things to read are either on the mountain sides or mountain tops. So uh, that first day, I was going up and down all day, but eventually I came to uh, Bovich, uh, which is about 10 kilometers away from uh, Koberid. And uh, there I came to my first cemetery. Um, and I saw many different cemeteries along the way, and I'll tell you about some of them. And uh, this is a cemetery right outside of Bovich, an Austro-Hungarian cemetery that has the remains of 600 Austro-Hungarian soldiers that were killed in the Bovich area. And uh, there are four soldiers per tombstone. There are 150 tombstones in this cemetery. So. So day two of my walk, um, the first thing I had to do was cross the Socha River uh, for the first time. This is the Socha, and it, the water is emerald green uh, against a white uh, river uh, bed. Um, this is pretty much all limestone through here, so that's what gives you the kind of the, the, the nice green color. But uh, to get over the river, I had to crawl over some rocks, and then there was a little footbridge. And when I got to the other side, I came to a little meadow, and I had to look up uh, to the top of Mount Golabar. This was my destination on day two. And, uh, you know, at 66 years old and never had climbed a mountain before in my life, um, it was a little bit daunting. But after about three hours of doing a lot of switchbacks all the way up, I got there. And I have to tell you that when you get to be 66, it's a lot easier going up the mountains than coming down. The coming down is really tough on the knees. But anyway, um, when I got up to the, this area here, which is my destination, uh, I walked a little bit, and I came to a little grass path through a meadow, and it took me to this monument right here. This monument was built in a, in a little pasture on top of the mountain, and it was built in 1916 by the Austro-Hungarian soldiers uh, in memory of those soldiers that had died in this area already. And uh, this uh, monument is in the middle of an unmarked cemetery. So I spent some time here just wondering about those lives and uh, what it was like to fight a, a war on a mountaintop. And then I kind of wandered into the woods behind here and there were all kinds of trenches and tunnels and caves to look at. So it was really a, kind of a fun day. But I walked all day and uh, as typical, I, I came out of the mountains in the evening. And after the first day of walking, I came into this little village called Dresnitsa. Dresnitsa was occupied by the Italians throughout the war. Uh, when I was coming down, I could also see my destination for day two. My destination for day two was on the front of Mount Corinne, but before I could get to Mount Corinne, I had to climb this mountain, Mount Planitza, first. So about, just about to the top of Mount Planitza, I was surprised. I came to just a little chapel on the mountainside, and, it's, and the name of that chapel is Chapel Bess. And this is at an elevation of about three quarters mile of elevation. And uh, this is the original painting on the inside of the chapel, which was built in 1920, in memory of the Italian soldiers that were killed in this area. And uh, the opening is guarded by a, an iron gate, and I was able to take this picture through the gate. Uh, as I mentioned, my destination for that day was uh, Mount Corinne, on, as I showed you on the previous picture. And as I was walking across the face of Mount Corinne, I could look across the Socha Valley, and I could see the top of the Colabrat Ridge. Now, Mount Corinne, where I was walking, was occupied by the Austro-Hungarians uh, throughout the war. 
and the Colavrat Ridge here was occupied by the Italians for the first 11 battles uh, of the war. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be talking about Colavrat quite a bit because it was important, especially in the 12th Sanzo battle. At the end of uh, day two of hiking, um, no, this would be day three, excuse me. I came to this structure right here. This is how it looks now. This is how it looked back in 1916. This is the Church of the Holy Spirit on Yavritz uh, Plateau. And um, this was built during the war by Austria-Hungary uh, in honor of the soldiers that had died already on Mount Corinne, where I had just walked, and also on a nearby mountain called Mersley Verg. And... Uh, this is the restored, renovated edition, and uh, as you see on the outside, uh, there are the coat of arms of all 20 provinces of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, it, this also uh, brings to mind a point that, you know, there were 20 provinces in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, each one with a different language or very, uh, some were similar, but uh, all different. And you add to that the Germans and the Turks, um, and, you know, all of a sudden you had about 20 different languages that were spoken within the Austro-Hungarian army. Um, so it made uh, communication a little bit of a challenge sometimes. Now, inside, uh, when they built this, the inside walls were made of wood. And this is the inside. There's beautiful paintings on the inside. But the inside walls are called the Book of the Dead. And uh, on these wood walls are inscribed the names of all the uh, soldiers that were killed in this area. And uh, total 2,565 names are on these walls. And uh, the, next, uh, the next day when I came out of the mountains, um, the first village I came to was this little village of Loche. And uh, here is the cemetery. Uh, where the majority of those people are buried. 3,000 soldiers are in this Austro-Hungarian cemetery in Loce, which is a beautiful cemetery right on the banks of the Tominska River, uh, which runs into the Asanzo. And uh, this was built uh, by, uh, in memory of the uh, members of the 30th Infantry Division. I'm going to step away from the walk a little bit and talk about uh, other aspects of war. And the first one, there were the civilians. And there were 90,000 people living in the area of the Isonzo battlefield at the start of the war. And uh, you can see that they were loaded on uh, trailers and uh, taken to refugee camps further inside Slovenia, some as far north as Vienna, Austria. And uh, I assume the picture on the right here is a soldier's family. It looks like these... Uh, people are heading off uh, to the refugee camps and this Slovenian soldier is going to be heading towards the battlefront. Um, but what did these people come home to? Um, especially those that lived in the valleys, they came home to uh, utter destruction. Uh, many of the buildings, especially in some of the older towns, were completely destroyed. Um, this is uh, what appears to be an orphanage. Uh, you have the children and the nuns. And uh, what used to be their living room, now they can hang their clothes outside. And uh, not only did they come home to destruction, but after the war, uh, they were no longer living in their native Slovenia, which was part of Austria-Hungary. Now they're living in Italy under the control of uh, Benito Mussolini. Nourishment uh, was also always a big issue, as you can be aware. Uh, starvation was common. Uh, this is a, a slaughterhouse for the Austro-Hungarian army, and the pork is a big thing over there, and these all appear to be pigs. Uh, I'm not a farmer, but I'm, I can recognize the short snout and the short legs. And, um, uh, but I guess everything was fair game. Uh, they even mentioned about the rats that they shot in the, uh, in the trenches. Um, and uh, this is a uh, bakery uh, to serve the army, the Austro-Hungarian army, and you can see the, the mountains in the background. Now, some of you aren't old enough to uh, remember uh, this product here, uh, oleo. Uh, certainly, I grew up on oleo. My parents went to Illinois and brought it back in the trunk of the car like, like a lot of people did. Um, but uh, 
This is also interesting. Uh, this was, uh, I took this picture in one of the museums. This is a can of Libby's brand Irish stew that came all the way from Argentina for the war effort. So Irish stew in Argentina. Um, I want to mention um, the horses. Uh, on all of the fronts of the World War I, uh, there were over two million horses uh, employed uh, to uh, do the work. And uh, in, especially in the Isonzo area where uh, it was such rugged terrain in the mountains, uh, the horses were especially, especially valuable. And when I say horses, I also include burros as part of that. Uh, this one happens to be wearing a gas mask, uh, just like uh, his uh, a trainer. Um, but getting water for the horses was uh, very difficult, and especially in the summertime when it was dry. And uh, when, even when I was doing my walk, uh, almost every road that I walked on, uh, there were these roadside cisterns. And uh, some of them are still functioning, uh, but most of them are turned off or dry. And uh, this was vitally important uh, to get the horses water during the, during the war effort. And uh, they even employed a couple dogs here to uh, do some of the work. This is a field hospital, um, an Austro-Hungarian field hospital, and the conditions were quite austere, uh, and the injuries were horrific. Uh, if you look at these uh, three men here, you don't see any headgear on them. Uh, you don't see a mask. Uh, you don't see rubber gloves. Uh, they're wearing rubber aprons, and uh, they probably uh, washed them off a couple times a day, and uh, all they had for sterilization was this gas stove. As I said, uh, the these are survivors, actually, um, you know, with uh, rather severe facial deformities, but they were fixed as well as they could be under the conditions. Now, one of the things that cost a lot of lives uh, uh, during this war uh, was the fact that they didn't have any antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics only became available in 1924, so after World War I, and uh, the topical uh, antiseptics they had were not that effective. And uh, there's a condition called gas gangrene. I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of that before. And actually, it's a specific infection. It's caused by a bacterium that's in the soil. Uh, it's called Clostridium perfringens. And uh, gas gangrene is like a flesh-eating bacteria. Once it uh, got into the soft tissues via a puncture wound or a bullet wound or whatever, um, it caused a rather severe destruction of the, of, of the soft tissues, the muscles and the other soft tissues. And the treatment for that would be initially opening and take, debriding the wound, taking out all the dead tissue and leaving it open and leaving it healed by secondary intention. But if that did not take care of the infection, the only other treatment was to amputate that extremity. And if, those, if that infection incur, occurred in an area that couldn't be amputated, uh, Generally, the patient became septic and died as a result of the infection. So gas gangrene was a, a major problem uh, on the Isonzo front, as it was probably elsewhere in World War I. Uh, on a little bit of a lighter side, um, this shows some of the uh, soldiers uh, doing lice patrol, uh, sitting on the uh, rocks overlooking the river. And uh, on the left, um, are some hospital nurses uh, that uh, were, according to the photographer, dutifully looking at the photographer. And the soldiers, I think, are all dutifully looking at the nurses, uh, except, except for this guy here. He, uh, you know, he wasn't interested, but the other guys were, so. So I continued my walk down. Uh, the next uh, place I came to was Tolmin in uh, uh, Slovenia. And uh, Tolmin was very important during the war. Uh, there was something called the Tolmin Bridgehead. And what that was is that there was actually a gap in the mountains by Tolmin um, that if the uh, Italians were able to get through that gap, uh, they would have had clear access to the central uh, Austrian Hungary. Um, uh, and uh, in the center of that gap was a hill called Mengori. And the Austro-Hungarians uh, defended that throughout the entire war, uh, despite the fact that they were being bombarded constantly from uh, the mountain on the other side of the river. And that mountain was uh, Kolovrat. So 
But remember Mengori because, uh, and uh, Tolmin because they were very important in the 12th Isonzo battle. Now, uh, at the park uh, that I went to that day, it was just you know, a round trip, it was only about eight miles. And so I walked there and it was really worthwhile because there were you know, tunnels all over the place and trenches and this was inside a cave. This is a painting above the altar in that cave. So it was time for me to leave uh, Tolmin and I left early on a Sunday morning and I had to go down 300 meters or so to get across uh, the bridge that went over the Asanzo River. So up until this time, I was walking on Austria-Hungarian territory and I was going to be crossing the river and going over to the Italian side of the war. But uh, I took this picture as I was walking down thinking, you know, it's really pretty with the fog over the uh, valley like that. But as I, I'd been back a couple times and there's always fog over the Asanzo in the morning. And uh, as I would further read about the war, the fog was vitally important during the war because uh, when it was dense during night and the early morning, uh, it allowed the troops to uh, work their way across the river valley without being detected from overhead. So once I crossed the bridge, I had to climb to the top of this mountain. This is uh, Kolovrat. And uh, once I got there, uh, there's a large outdoor museum uh, there. It was Sunday afternoon, and uh, I really couldn't believe how many cars were there and people, you know, these are all native people, Slovenians and Italians, you know, at this outdoor museum. And there's many different outdoor museums along this walk of peace. And I generally found other people there when I was at them, um, except if it was in the middle of the week. Um, but uh, the, they have restored trenches and bunkers. This happens to be inside a cave. And I was looking out through this window that I'm sure was used by a machine gunner. And uh, the mountain I'm looking at across the way is the mountain that I walked across a few days earlier, uh, Mount Corinne. So, um, the other day I was on the, Austri the Austrian-Hungarian side looking at Kolovrat and the Italians. Now I'm on the Italian side on Kolovrat looking at uh, Karim across the valley. Some of the artillery, and uh, excuse me if I don't have the correct terms for these, uh, can inform me um, that this is a mortar. I hope can. So anyway. Um, and these were in the, in the valleys and uh, designed to shoot up uh, onto the mountain sides or to the top of the mountain. Uh, these are the larger cannons uh, on top of the mountain. Um, and, uh, um, and you can see another part of the war here is that the war uh, on the Azonzo front, there were two long winters during that period of time. And not only, you know, the conditions were rough enough to begin with, but add snow and ice to that and the cold. Uh, that made it even worse. This particular cannon uh, was not uh, on the Isonzo front, just a little bit west of the Isonzo front on a mountain in Italy. And the story behind this, and just uh, to, I bring this up just to talk about the frustration, um, they were able to get this cannon on top of this mountain, which is over two miles high. And the word is that the cannon was never fired during the entire war. And then when the war was over, uh, they just left it there. So now there's a national park here, uh, and this is one of the features of the national park at Adamello. So the logistics on how did you get these, uh, these cannons and, you know, uh, to where they needed to be? Well, in the very mountainous area, they had to be disassembled to get them to the mountaintops. And uh, this kind of shows that, um, where uh, they were using ropes and a pulley system uh, to gradually get them up the mountain. You can see this rudimentary ladder here, and you can also see snow on the ground, uh, making a treacherous job even more treacherous. Uh, this was in uh, the non-mountainous area of the front, of the Asanzo front, uh, kind of probably in the cross area, where the hills are still 200 and 300 meters high, but they're not the, the very high mountains. And uh, in order to get this cannon to the top of the hill, you can see it took human power to pull this up there. Um, this is an example of the largest shell uh, that was used in the war. 
uh, on the Isonzo front. It was a 422 miller, millimeter caliber. Uh, it was uh, a little over five feet long. It weighed uh, 2,200 pounds and had a range of about 7.5 miles. And uh, in this uh, walk of uh, peace book that my cousin gave me, uh, there is an entire page dedicated to war uh, it, actually a warning that if on your walk of peace, uh, if you came across anything that looked like an unexploded ordinance, uh, that you shouldn't touch it and uh, make note of it and uh, notify somebody because uh, there still are uh, unexploded ordinances uh, out along uh, this area. And uh, I think these guys here, I call them the bomb squad here, they were probably out in 1935 looking for war stuff uh, out in, uh, among the mountains. And I think they came up with this. Um, they also came up with a pickaxe and a shovel. This guy has a harmonica. It looks like this guy found an Austrian-Hungarian helmet. And so I think this was probably the guy in charge. But, and um, this is another photo op of uh, unexploded ordnance in, uh, in the Isonzo River. And uh, some guy taking his chances and uh, sitting next to it. Other elements or other uh, things of war uh, that I saw at the museums, uh, these are uh, different hand grenades. Uh, this is, uh, these are landmines that were used. And as I mentioned earlier, puncture wounds were deadly. And uh, this is a jaw trap, and so that when a soldier stepped in there, um, it had all these uh, spikes along the trap that would penetrate the lower extremity. Um, and then this was called an Italian hedgehog. Uh, and it was basically a bundle of uh, sharp metal spears, uh, and uh, you know it was used to impale uh, the opposition. And uh, as I mentioned again, if you got a puncture wound, that wound got infected. You know that was as good as getting you know shooting somebody uh, because those wounds were uh, debilitating. If they didn't die, they were unlikely going to uh, return to duty. Now another. Th um, implement of war that I have mentioned here are rocks. And uh, I was, as I was walking along uh, on these trails, you could see where the mortars hit, um, you know, the craters that were left and the stones that were piled up around these craters from the uh, blasts that occurred. And these mountains are all dolomite and um, limestone. And so the fragments of rocks were all sharp. I know certainly walking over them was difficult because of their sharp edges. And uh, so, you know, flying rocks was a, a, a significant cause of morbidity and mortality on the uh, Azonzo front. And uh, one day I was at a museum and I ran into this man um, who was actually a principal at one of the schools in Nova Goritza. And, uh, and you know, people all along the Azonzo front uh, have stories to tell uh, that have been passed down through the family. And most of the people I talked to were talking about their grandparents. And uh, this man re, uh, told me about uh, his grandfather who was in the war. And uh, when they ran out of ammo, which they frequently did, uh, one of the only things that he could do uh, was to uh, throw rocks at the opposition until more ammo arrived. Now, Ken said that I could put in a little social stuff here as I was uh, in my talk. And uh, every day I started my day with uh, about four or five liters of water in my backpack and some energy bars. But if I came across a restaurant or something to eat on the way, I'd never passed it up. And one day I was walking in, uh, in Italy, town of Doberdog, and I saw some people, saw a couple of men sitting outside this little place having uh, a beer. And it was mid-afternoon, I thought, you know, it's time for me to get something to drink. So I went and sat down, ordered a beer, and then I saw a little blackboard that said, today's special is pork shank with mashed potatoes and a salad. And the cost was five euros, which is a little more than five dollars. And uh, so not only did I order that, but the waitress asked me where I was headed. And I said, I'm trying to get to Jam uh, and which was another five or six kilometers down the road. And she says, do you have a place to stay? And I said, no. And uh, she said, I'll find you a place. And before I was finished with dinner, she found me a place to stay that night, which was very nice. Uh, this dinner is very typical Slovenian fare. Um, it's grilled squid uh, along with uh, potatoes and spinach and wine. Uh, this happened to be in a little uh, town called Zadomi. Uh, this is a soup uh, that's uh, 
uh, very traditional in the Asanzo area in the Alps. Um, it's called Yota, J-O-T-A, and it's pickled cabbage, pickled turnips, beans, potatoes, and this one happened to have a kielbasa in it, and it's always much better with one of these. Uh, and uh, this meal was memorable uh, because I had just walked 28 miles over a two-day period and it was uh, late on a Monday afternoon when I got into this little town of called Ganyache. And I had talked to someone along the way and they said, oh, there's a great little restaurant there, you have to go to it. So I found the restaurant and I get there and it was a Monday and like in, a, in the United States, it was closed. And, uh, but it was kind of a farm uh, restaurant combination and the lady uh, who owned the restaurant um, saw me and I, and I asked, is there somewhere else to eat? And she said, no, uh, not on a Monday. And she says, I'll make you a ham sandwich. And so this is my ham sandwich. This is the ham and the, and the cheese. And there, were, there was enough bread here for six sandwiches and I ate them all. And, uh, the, and she gave me some of the wine that they made on their farm. And this was a half liter and I took care of all that. And uh, she charged me three euros for everything, so I know. It was like, what a doll. And, uh, and finally, uh, usually when I came out of the mountains in the evening, uh, I'd go to the nearest village and I'd look for a sign above the door and the sign uh, was spelled S-O-B-E and it's pronounced soba and that's the Slovenian term for bed. And uh, so I, I went up to, she had a sign hanging out from her house uh, and then knocked on the door, and her name is Dragica, and uh, Dragica did not speak any English. And so she pointed, she says, you, you wait right here. She wouldn't let me in the house. And she went across the street and got her neighbor, who fortunately taught English to Slovenian children. And uh, so the neighbor came over, and she negotiated our stay, or my stay, and uh, Draga re Dra Dragica related to the lady, that the first thing that I needed to do was to go up to my room and take a shower and bring down my, my dirty and stinking clothes. And uh, so when I did that, Dragica did my laundry for me that night. So I had fresh uh, laundry that morning. And uh, she also gave me this, uh, served me this wonderful breakfast, uh, which was pretty typical of the places I stayed. They'd always include breakfast and you know, staying at a place uh, with breakfast in the morning and a place to stay and take a shower uh, was about 20 euros a night, so it was uh, pretty comfortable. Another area, one of my favorite areas in Slovenia is called the Kras, uh, or the Karst area, and this is a, uh, one of the, probably the best wine growing area in Slovenia, and uh, it was also the site of heavy fighting during the war. As a matter of fact, 80% of the vineyards in Slovenia were destroyed uh, during uh, the war, especially on the war on the, um, the Azanzo front. Uh, but when I was there, uh, the, the vineyards had been restored and uh, they were actually harvesting the grapes for this year's wine production. But as I walked along, uh, all you'd have to do is go about 10 feet off the road and pick a, a handful of, a uh, couple of bunches of grapes and you'd eat them as you went along. Uh, one evening I went to a restaurant and uh, the lady working the restaurant, her name was Ethel. And um, Ethel uh, came up to me after my dinner and she said, how'd you like it? And I said, good. And she said, how'd you like the wine? I said, oh, it was, it was really special. And she said, oh, you want to see the wine cellar? And you know, I never pass up that. And so uh, I'm thinking it's right either underneath the restaurant or right next to it. She says, get in my car. And uh, so off I went with Ethel to her home, and this is Ethel's husband, Sasha, and his friend. And uh, they were finishing up this year's wine production, uh, and they pressed their grapes by hand. And, you know, I really, w I watched them do it. And these are strong guys, and they were really working hard. Uh, this was just a photo opportunity for me. But, um, and then the last thing about the cross that I want to mention is this church right here. This is in a little village of Sveto, and uh, Sveto is about 200 people. But this church was built in the late 1500s and served as an army hospital uh, in World War I. Other structures that I saw along the way, uh, plenty of tunnels. And uh, this one happened to be in the outdoor museum at uh, uh, Vodice in the mountains. And uh, there were 
as I said, there were tunnels all over. And um, I was traveling alone. I did this entire walk by myself. And so I would often go in a little bit to explore the tunnel, but I never lost sight of the opening to the tunnel. Because if you get in here, it's a labyrinth of uh, tunnels that go in different directions. And uh, I decided that I did not want to spend the last couple days of my life lost in a tunnel in Slovenia. So I didn't really go into the tunnels very far. There were bunkers all over. Uh, this one happened to be in a farm field and there were cows out that day. And you can see the bunker with the openings on all four sides. Um, it looks like the cows even graze on top of the bunker, but they you know, managed to leave these trees get away. And finally, uh, you know, World War I was a trench warfare war. Uh, there were hundreds of miles of trenches that I saw as I walked. This one happened to, is a famous trench. It's called Trincea de la Frasch. Uh, which means uh, trenches of the branches. And uh, these trenches were built by the Austro-Hungarians. Uh, and because it was a non-mountaineers, there were a lot of branches to be had. And they covered up the tops of the trenches to avoid detection by the uh, overhead observation. And talking about overhead observation, uh, this was one of the observation balloons. Uh, Austria-Hungary had three of them. The Italians had eight. And these were used in the non-mountainous parts of the Isonzo Front. You really didn't need them in the mountains because you're a mile high on the mountain overlooking the river. Um, and you, didn't, you, know, you could pretty much see from the top of the mountain what was going on. Uh, but these were used in the non-mountainous areas. And they were manned. And they were mobile. And uh, they could go to an altitude of 400 to 800 meters, depending upon the visibility and the weather. But they were very labor intensive. And this is amazing that just for one balloon, uh, 143 soldiers, 82 horses, 31 carts, three trucks, three gas developers, one photo lab, a landline phone that ran from the basket here down to the ground so they could report their findings, a motorized winch uh, to help pack up the balloon when they needed to move on. But the amazing thing is, to generate enough hydrogen to fill this balloon, it required 8,000 gallons of water uh, for each fill. And uh, especially in the summertime, the drier times of the year, um, the water wasn't that plentiful. So actually, the water was uh, the limiting factor in the use of these balloons. And the, and the fact that water was limiting factor probably made it uh, more important for, uh, for uh, the air um, the airplanes, and uh, there were airfields on both sides of the front. Uh, the Italians had the uh, upper hand there because just beyond the mountains where they were stationed was the Friuli lowlands, and uh, there was more room for uh, airfields there. The Austro-Hungarian airfields were more like 40 to 50 kilometers to the north of the mountains because there was no place in the mountains to put an airfield. Now, early in the war, uh, the airplanes were used pretty much for uh, reconnaissance. But as the technology improved during the war, uh, the planes could fly higher. Uh, and uh, later in the war, they were equipped with machine guns. And uh, I did see pictures of uh, land-to-air um, um, guns. As, and uh, um, no one could tell me if the machine guns shot uh, down to the ground, but they shot at the other planes, apparently. So I want to talk about this. Uh, particular uh, place that I visited. This is called uh, the uh, Monument of Peace. Uh, it's a museum on, on the mountain of Syrie, uh, which is uh, just outside the cross area uh, near uh, Kostanjevica. And uh, this uh, Monument of Peace was built in 2017, so it was just a year old when I visited. And uh, it's dedicated not specifically to World War I, but to all the wars that Slovenia has been in. And uh, this mural is right inside the main entrance. Uh, and the artist is a Slovenian whose grandfather fought in World War I, so it was this painting is dedicated to him. And uh, there's a lot of symbolism in here. Um, this side of the painting is dark. This side is brighter. You see the white horse here, and some of you probably heard of a type of horse called the Lipizzaner Stallions. The Lipizzaner Stallions originated in Slovenia in a little town called Lipica, which uh, probably was about 50, uh, 50 kilometers from the front. And uh, 
also, these are all skeletons sitting here, skeletons of past war. Uh, one was decapitated, uh, but um, uh, the hats, typical Slovenian army hat. This is an alpine hat, an Italian helmet underneath the chair, a typical uh, a Slovenian hat with a um, uh, grouse feather. And uh, this is an Austro-Hungarian hat. And here is a fez uh, representing the, um, the Bosniak soldiers. But the naked woman, um, she represents fertility and the future of Slovenia. And she's turned in such a way that her back is to war and she's facing the bright future of Slovenia. Now, the year that I went to, to Slovenia to do this walk was 2018, and that was the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. And uh, at the Pope Maroon Museum, or uh, office, and also at a museum run by Pope Maroon in uh, Rodopulia in Italy, um, I came across uh, uh, this structure here. Or this, uh, they, they handed me this packet uh, when I came in, and it's an Italian soldier reaching across, putting his hand on an Austro-Hungarian shoulder, and uh, this man putting his hand onto the uh, Italian soldier. And in here were seeds for flowers, and the, name, and the flowers are forget-me-nots. And I must say that there still is a lot of... Uh, they haven't forgotten the war uh, in this area. It was devastating to their uh, ancestors. And everyone is always willing to talk about the war and uh, the experiences of their family. This is uh, uh, further on down, uh, the Asanzo, uh, and this was a, a very important area. This is Mount Sabatine, uh, as it looked back during the war. Uh, this is as it looks now. And uh, uh, this was standing on Sabatine, looking across the valley at uh, Mount Svetogora and Mount Scabriel. And, uh, on, and the Scabriel was the site of the 11th Asanso battle. Now, uh, get, going back to Sabatine, uh, when I was walking up there that day, I made a critical mistake about uh, halfway up. There was a sign that uh, showed the Pope Maru Trail going off to the right, and I kind of looked at it and looked you know, like it was going to be kind of boring, mostly following a road to the top of Sabatine. Instead, there was another trail going off to the left through a wooded area, um, and it was a mountaineering trail. And I said, you know, it doesn't look that bad. I can do that. And so after about uh, 500 meters, I came to this edge, and I had to walk across this edge all the way over to here. And uh, the trail was right on the, on the edge of this uh, mountain that pretty much went straight down uh, to the Azanzo River below. And uh, you can, this is, as I mentioned, this was uh, kind of controlled by the Italians. And uh, there's, you see the tunnels on the side of the mountains that made, and there's also some uh, wooden structures that they built outside. Now, the 11th Azanzo battle was a critical battle. Um, it was the bloodiest battle on the Austro-Hungarian side of the Azanzo, and what happened is the Italians attacked from three different directions um, and uh, forced the Austro-Hungarians to the top of Scabriel, and uh, they were the uh, Austro-Hungarians were able to hold their position there, uh, but the number of casualties was uh, marked. Uh, the Italians had 168,000 casualties, and uh, the Austro-Hungarians had a thousand casualties. Uh, just in this uh, one battlefield area. Um, this is again is a picture of uh, Mount Svetogora. And when, on, when I did my trip back in 2018, I walked into a village of Sulkan and I found a place to stay and it was owned by this man. His name is Tony Gamicic. And uh, Tony was really a nice guy, really into the history, spoke English well. And he's a journalist, and he writes features for wine and food, not only in Slovenia, but also in Italy and other parts of Eastern Europe. And so when I told people later on, oh, I stayed with Tony, and they said, oh, everybody knows Tony, and this and that. Well, this year when I went back on the trip that you paid for, um, I, I stayed with Tony, and uh, Tony said, let's climb Spetagora today. And I said, okay. 
Um, I have to say that hiking is the number one recreational activity uh, in Slovenia, uh, as it is in a lot of Europe. Um, on weekends, people don't stay home. They, they head to the mountains and hike in the mountains. But Tony, as we were climbing the mountain, we're about three quarters to the top, and Tony says, I'm going to take you on the longest 266 meters that you've ever walked. And uh, he had done this before, obviously. So uh, we got to the opening of the tunnel. And for the first uh, probably 30 meters or so, uh, it was pretty level. Dark as could be, you turned, if you turned off your headlight, you couldn't see anything. And, uh, but the only part of the early tunnel was that the ceiling height was low. It was only about five and a half feet high. So you had to kind of walk crunched over. But then came the next part of the tunnel for the next 200 meters was all uphill. It was at about a 45 degree angle. And uh, you know, you people that had served time in the military, you had done this before. You had uh, climbed uh, inclines with a rope and trying to keep your feet underneath you. And, uh, but for me at you know, age 67 now, uh, it was a new challenge. And you can tell I'm doing really well. My, I'm watching my feet with every step and uh, kind of shaking on the inside. But uh, I made it. And uh, retrospectively, it was a lot of fun. Um, but uh, this uh, tunnel went uh, uh, through the mountain uh, from one side to the other and was used throughout the war by the Austro-Hungarian troops. And once we got to the top of the mountain, here's another um, uh, sculpture of peace um, with a dove on his hand. Doctor, let's take a quick seven inning stretch. So if anybody wants to quietly stand up and okay. stretch your legs for, for a minute. Sounds mm -hmm. Hey, thanks. Okay. Okay, Ken uh, let me know that I need to talk a little bit faster and move through this a little quicker. So um, I have about hopefully 20, just 20 minutes to go, and then we'll do some question and answer if we have time. Uh, this is another structure I want to talk about because this kind of gives a little history of a war of the war in itself. This is the Solken Bridge, and it's a railroad bridge, and it was built in 1905 by the Austro-Hungarians. And uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, it's a stone arch bridge, and it was at that time the longest stone arch bridge in the world. And you know what? It still is today because I think part of it is because they don't build bridges like that anymore. But um, so this is a railroad bridge, and it was very important railroad bridge because uh, this rail line connected Trieste, the city on the seaport, you know, the seaport city that Italy wanted, and it connected to the rest of uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, this rail line, and um, as I mentioned early on, that the Austro-Hungarians uh, decided to um, you know, just to let uh, the Italians have this side of the river at the start of the war and the Austro-Hungarians on this side. So um, in conceding that, uh, the Austro-Hungarians wanted to make sure that the Italians could not get across this bridge uh, during the war. So Austria-Hungary uh, Austria blew up their own bridge. And uh, so this is what it looked like in 1915. This is the Isonzo River running through it. Uh, after the war, um, now this area was controlled by the Italians now, and they put up this temporary structure immediately after the war. It's an iron bridge uh, so that the railroad could get across. Um, but by 1927, uh, they had pretty much reconstructed this bridge. And this is a photo that I took uh, on my most recent trip this September. And I was standing right about here, uh, looking at the same bridge. And uh, it was a beautiful day when I was there. So this is the reconstructed bridge. And you can see it's just a little bit different. Uh, there's only four arches instead of five from the original bridge. I want to talk about this man. Uh, this is General Svetovar Borojevic, uh, also known as the Knight from Socha. And uh, when the war started, Borojevic was sent to the Eastern Front. Um, but when war became imminent along the Zanzo or the Southwest Front, he was transferred back. 
and it was uh, Baroyevich was originally from this area, uh, actually uh, just over the border from Croatia. And, uh, but he knew the area well, and he was the one that convinced the Austro-Hungarian uh, leadership that they should set up on the Socha River as opposed to inland on the Saba. Um, this man here is a friend of Tony's, uh, but on weekends this man goes to the outdoor museums uh, in his General Baroyevich uh, uh, uniform. And um, this man in real life uh, owns six different vineyards. So one evening Tony and I went to visit him. He got all dressed up in his uniform. He has his original uh, uh, World War I sword. And uh, we, I think we sampled something from each one of these barrels that night and uh, ate a lot of good Slovenian cuisine. But again, uh, I just want to repeat again that the Slovenians are very much into the war history. Um, there's all these outdoor museums and uh, people are always willing to talk about the war. Um, I don't know who this man is. I don't know where it was taken, but to me, uh, a good photograph is one that wants to tell you a story. Uh, when you can look at a photograph and you say, I want to know the story behind this man. And uh, that's what it was about this photograph. Um, it's obviously an older soldier, has on his Austro-Hungarian cap, has a heavy backpack, and his rifle. And uh, I don't know, I just uh, feel like if I could talk to this man, it would probably be worth uh, uh, worth my while uh, just to hear his story and uh, that's the other thing when I'm talking about the, the war you know and here I am I'm climbing mountains that I never climbed before and getting the best physical workout ever in my life and I as I was going up those mountains I often thought about those soldiers back then you know they didn't have two hundred dollar hiking boots they didn't have nice hiking poles I was carrying 30 pounds on my back and uh, you know, they were carrying anywhere from 70 to 120 pounds on their back. And uh, more than anything, nobody was shooting at me while I was climbing the mountains. Uh, and uh, they had to persevere, all of that. So, and they had to do it sometimes in the winter. And I was doing it in very nice weather. This is the village of Sulkan. And I mentioned my friend Tony. Uh, this is Tony's grandparents' home um, after the war. And... Uh, this segment right here is now Tony's home, uh, right here. Um, and this is the room where I stay when I stay with Tony. But uh, so this was their grandparents' home, and you can see all the windows are blown out. There, there's no roof. Uh, you can see Mount Sabatine in the background. And uh, again, not only did they come home to this destruction, they also came home to a land that was now Italy uh, under the control of the fascist. My favorite outdoor museum is at Brestovich, and uh, I visited here back with my cousins uh, uh, three years earlier, uh, but I really wanted to go back. Um, it's a tunnel through a mountain, and um, at the one end of the tunnel is the Austro-Hungarian uh, entrance to the tunnel. Um, at the other side, on the other entrance, uh, is the uh, Italian. On the Austro-Hungarian side, you see this metal sculpture and the man saying La Pace, which means the peace. And on the Italian side, it says Vogliamo la pace, meaning we want peace. And uh, this uh, area was occupied by both the Italians and the Austro-Hungarians during the war. Um, and outside of each end of the tunnel, uh, this actually is a World War I trench here. You can, you can kind of see the wall of it here and another wall here, but this is an unrestored trench. And uh, there are plenty of those remaining uh, they can't restore them all, um, but this is how they get overgrown after a hundred years. Now when you walk through this tunnel, there were these little placards on the, on the floor, and uh, I read every one of them, and uh, I picked out a couple that really meant a lot to me. The first one, uh, written by A.G., uh, they order us to jump over the wall, we have our bayonets fixed, and we advance. Once out there, the men fall like wheat before the reaper. And, you know, it was mostly trench warfare and uh, jumping out of the trench to, to advance and uh, the opposition was just waiting with their machine guns to gun you down. This is another 
uh, written by ESG, and it says, Dear Mom, I'm writing to you while we are waiting for the order to advance. There is a possibility that I shall fall. So if I do not return, I wish to leave this last goodbye note. Just a few miles, of, or a you know, five-kilometer walk from Brestovich is Monte San Michel, um, and there's an outdoor museum there. It's on top of a mountain, uh, not quite as high as the mountains in the upper Socha area, uh, but uh, when I got to the top of the mountain, I could look to the north and see the um, Zanzo uh, River down below um, and the beauty of the valley, but if I look in the other direction, for the first time, I could see the Adriatic in the distance, and uh, it's as if I could almost smell it. I knew I was getting close to my destination. But uh, Monte San Michel was the site of the first gas attack on the uh, Azanzo front. Uh, it was launched by the Austro-Hungarians against the Italians, and uh, the name of the gas was phosgene, and phosgene is an odorless, colorless gas, uh, and it uh, kills people by um, suffocation, basically. Uh, it's very irritating to the uh, respiratory lining in the lungs and causing them to uh, fill up with fluid very rapidly and the victims die basically of suffocation. And uh, uh, when they unleashed this gas attack on June 29, 1916, uh, it took two hours to claim 6,000 Italian lives just with one gas attack. This is probably uh, the biggest monument along the uh, Walk of Peace. This is in Redapulia, Italy. And uh, this is an amazing structure. It's called the Italian Charnel House, again, uh, a, a large um, uh, mausoleum. And the tracks up here are called the Path of Heroes. And when I first uh, did this walk in 2018, this was under construction. There was a, a chain link fence uh, right down by the road here, and you could not enter this. Um, so. When I went back this year, I said I really wanted, this is one place that I really wanted to visit again. And uh, unfortunately, it's still under construction, but I was able to get up about to this level, okay? And uh, this uh, Italian charnel house is the burial place for 100,187 soldiers. And uh, as you ascend, uh, each level here has this word, presente, uh, written repeatedly uh, across the front of each level. And under, underneath the word presente are 16 names of soldiers that are buried there. Now, um, as I said, there were over 100,000 soldiers buried here. Um, 60,000 of them remain unidentified, and they're in a large vault at, at the top. The others are listed here. There is one woman uh, in, this, uh, in this memorial, and she was a nurse that was killed. Uh, there were 75 seamen uh, that, were, that are also here that were killed in a naval battle. This is the Italian flag. Um, right across the street uh, from uh, the uh, Charnel House is this great outdoor museum. Um, I wasn't expecting to find it, but uh, it, you kind of walked up the side of a mountain to get there, and they had all this uh, great Italian uh, artillery, and uh, they had these little stone things as you were going up. It was like you were reading the Stations of the Cross as you were ascending the mountain, uh, but they were uh, all the, they, there were history placards, and uh, this is a helmet. Some of them were, had barbed wire with wire cutters and that type of thing, so it was, uh, also in Red Apulia were two wonderful museums. One of them was uh, associated with this park, uh, but everything was in Italian, so uh, I, I went through it. I was able to grasp the idea of what was going on there. Uh, but the other museum was in a railroad uh, uh, terminal or a, a building, an old one, and uh, it was a Pope Maru museum, and it was fantastic. The people were very nice. Uh, there was a lot of information about the war, especially about the timeline of the war. So I'm kind of getting towards the end of my walk. Um, this is the outdoor museum uh, at Montfalcone. And this area, this is again one of those areas that when uh, uh, at the beginning of the war was uh, Slovenia, or part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but now it's uh, Montfalcone, um, uh, Italy. The Slovenia, uh, Slovenia name for this uh, 
Montfalcone is Tersich. But anyway, this is an outdoor museum, uh, extensive uh, array of tunnels and uh, trenches here. And uh, further on down the road, as I was heading towards my destination for the day, I came across this structure right along the highway. I almost missed it. Uh, I don't know, I must have been watching my feet too much or whatever, but this is called the Wolves of Tuscany. Um, and it's right outside the village of San Giovanni. And uh, it's called uh, this wolf here, the sculpture. One is howling at the uh, sky as if summoning other troops. Uh, the other one is looking down at the troops on the ground. Um, is the symbolism with that. And uh, it's called the Wolves of Tuscany because the Italian soldiers that defended this area uh, came from central Italy and uh, from Tuscany or Toscana. And finally, my uh, destination for the end of the day was in uh, a village of Dueno, uh, right on the Adriatic. And probably about the last two kilometers, I walked along uh, the cliff overlying the, or overlooking the sea. And uh, I went into this cave, and there was this lookout here over the sea. And this was utilized during World War I. So we're going to go back to the 12th Asanzo battle, because this was the decisive battle. And uh, um, I mentioned the losses that occurred in the 11th battle. And after that 11th battle, uh, Bravojevich, the general, uh, asked the Germans for help. Uh, he was feeling that. Uh, if they didn't get the help of the Germans, the Italians might overrun them. So um, the Germans uh, sent troops to this area. And uh, with the uh, 12th Asanzo battle, um, they attacked the city of Caporetto. And you meant, I mentioned Bovich early on, about 10 kilometers away. So troops came from Bovich towards Caporetto. And again, Caporetto is the same as Coburid. Caporetto being the Italian name, Coburid the Slovenian name. So there was actually a gas attack uh, launched by the Austro-Hungarians in Germany up in this area. But the main uh, 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 troops came uh, from Tolmin. And this is the Mangori Hill that I talked about earlier. And the Austro-Hungarians already controlled this area, this side of the river. Uh, so they sent troops up this bank of the river, more troops up this bank, and then they had the clear uh, the mountains. This is Kolovrat um, that I talked about earlier, held by the Italians for the first 11 battles. Now there were two uh, German uh, armies that uh, did this. Uh, the first was the Bavarian lifeguards, uh, infantry unit that went to the top of the mountain and cleared the top of the mountain. But the side of the mountain also needed to be cleared and that came uh, under the leadership of this man uh, Erwin Rommel, and uh, uh, he uh, and his men uh, were able to clear the mountainside and they were able to take uh, control of Kolovrat. Well, after that was accomplished, uh, they, the, all the troops met at the top, and the, apparently, as I read, that uh, the Bavarian lifeguard uh, commander said, as we move on to Mount Madior, which was the final destination, uh, of this offensive, um, the Bavarian lifeguards told Rommel that his troops would be doing cleanup. And uh, Rommel uh, took offense at that and uh, apparently stayed up all night and uh, before moving on, presented his plan to, uh, his plan to General Strasser, uh, pictured here. And uh, Strasser uh, liked what Rommel had put together and put Rommel in charge of marching uh, you know, being the, uh, the lead marcher or the lead uh, forces uh, going all the way to Matiur, uh, which was further down in the valley or down in the mountain range uh, across from Caporetto. And uh, they successfully did this. And for his uh, leadership in this area, um, Rommel was afforded uh, the Blue Max, which is uh, one of the highest uh, uh, honors in, in Germany. Uh, this, was, this is actually uh, General Cadorna. Uh, Cadorna was the leader of the Italian troops uh, throughout the first 12 battles of the war. And uh, he had some success, some of the battles he won. A lot of, and a lot of them ended in a draw. There were a couple that uh, Austria-Hungary won. 
But uh, as I mentioned earlier, the battle lines didn't change all that much. It was basically from mountaintop to mountaintop. And um, after the 12th Isonzo battle, uh, Cadorna was relieved of his duty because the Austrian and Hungarians and the Germans were very successful. They were marched right down to Caporetto, but they didn't stop there. They kept pushing the Italians further into Italy, and they pushed them all the way to the Piava River uh, in Italy. And in the process of this offensive, going back here, uh, the offensive started on uh, October 24th, 1917, and ended on 11-9-1917. And they pushed, uh, with that, they were able to push the Italians all the way back to the uh, Piava. In the process, they took 280,000 Italian BOWs. Uh, there were 350,000 Italian deserters. Uh, and there were 400,000 Italian refugees uh, uh, in this area. Now, uh, I, I mentioned Udine in Italy, and uh, only for the reason that I was in Udine um, in the fall of 2017, and uh, it was, I was just uh, you know, checking out parts of Italy, and um, I took this picture of this uh, building uh, kind of in the, old, uh, in the old town in the city center. And, uh, you know, they had a beautiful sculpture out in front. Uh, and then when I was in uh, Red Apulia at the museum there, I came across this picture. And uh, 100 years later, uh, or 100 years earlier from when I was there, uh, here's a, uh, an army uh, wagon pulled by a horse, uh, a soldier, all soldiers sitting along here, same building, I'm not sure if this is the same statue or not, but uh, it was, I don't know, to me it was uh, more than a coincidence. But. So at, what happened after uh, the 12th Isonzo battle, which basically was the last battle on the Isonzo front, as I mentioned, uh, the Italians were pushed all the way back to here. This was uh, the, um, where the fighting was during the war, okay, this was the, the front back during the war, and after the war, uh, after the 12th battle, this was the new front along the Piava River. And over a year, uh, over a year's time, uh, there were recurrent battles back and forth uh, in that area. But uh, the Italians uh, uh, promoted this man, General Diaz, to command the troops uh, since they had let go of Cadorna. Diaz was able to reorganize the Italian army and strengthen the army over that year period. And uh, the Australian, uh, Austria-Hungarian Hungarian army uh, was weakened when the Germans pulled their troops out of this area uh, because things weren't going well on the Western Front and they needed all those troops on the Western Front. So the Germans pulled their troops, uh, the Italian army got stronger, and uh, on the one-year anniversary of the start of the 12th uh, Zanzo War, uh, Diaz led his troops uh, across the river and they marched all the way to Vittorio um, and with the Battle of Vittorio Veneto uh, on the one-year anniversary of the 12th offensive, uh, they defeated the Austro-Hungarians uh, in that battle and Austria-Hungary uh, surrendered to the Italians and a, a couple days later an armistice was signed on November 3rd, 1918. So I'm ending the last two days of my walk and uh, uh, the, my last evening on the trail, the last uh, five miles or so, I got to walk along a trail along the Adriatic uh, from uh, Nebrugina uh, to Santa Croce. And uh, the sun was setting as I was walking. And what normally would have taken me maybe about an hour and a half, took about two and a half hours because I kept stopping to take pictures of the beautiful sunsets over the uh, Adriatic. So the next Morning after a good night's sleep, I had about uh, eight hours of walking to do on my final day of walking. When I started out on the road, I came to the last of the cemeteries that I was to visit. Uh, and uh, this is a cemetery, uh, Austro-Hungarian, for 5,000 Austro-Hungarian soldiers. And uh, this cemetery was recently uh, redone uh, by uh, university students and faculty from a university in Vienna, Austria. And uh, they came down and identified the soldiers that were buried in each of these graves and uh, did uh, nameplates for them. And they had uh, 
uh, some wonderful information pieces there to read. So uh, it was a nice tribute to those soldiers. And uh, the, shortly after, I came to this uh, city in Italy called Prosecco. And for you wine connoisseurs out there that have had Prosecco wine, this is where Prosecco wine comes from, uh, this particular area. And this is the Italian name uh, of this village, Prosecco. But as I mentioned earlier, this used to be part of Slovenia. And they still, on all of these roads, they also have the Slovenian names. Uh, Prosek is the Slovenian name for this area. And when I was walking in this area and I needed directions, uh, sometimes I'd walk up to people and I'd ask and I'd say, uh, buongiorno, and uh, sometimes they would you know, say buongiorno. Uh, other times they would say, no, no, no. He says, you know, we're mostly Slovenian living in this area. You know, it was just taken away from us by the Italians. So, um, so there were a lot of ethnic Slovenians left in this area, and I think that's why they leave up the Slovenian signs. And finally, uh, but you know, when I went through Prosecco, it was a little, it was still like 10, 10 o'clock in the morning, so it was too early to have a Prosecco in Prosecco, but the next time I go back to Prosecco, I'm gonna have a Prosecco. And, uh, and finally, this is my destination. This is the port city of Trieste. And uh, I'm on uh, halfway up a mountain when I took this picture. It took me about an hour and a half to walk down to the uh, seaside. And when I got there, I walked immediately to the sea next to this statue and uh, found someone to take my picture. And uh, for me, uh, it was the end of my uh, big adventure. And uh, I had walked 288 kilometers or 180 miles in over 18 days. Uh, my cousin Marco uh, made this uh, map for me uh, of uh, each day, the segments that I walked in different colors. And uh, for me, I finished my walk in 2018 uh, right here by the sea. And I have 1910 up here because in 1910, my grandparents, Frank Novak and Maria Jerche, uh, were married in Slovenia in February. Two days later, they came to the port city of Trieste, uh, boarded a ship for America, um, and they started their great adventure in the same place that I kind of ended mine. Theirs was much bigger, theirs was much greater than mine was, but, um, and uh, they never went back to Slovenia. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, they initially went, like a lot of immigrant families, to the iron mines in northern Minnesota, uh, but my grandfather was a farmer and uh, wanted to farm. And uh, he eventually started, uh, he initially had a farm over in western Wisconsin, but then moved his family uh, to Grafton, Wisconsin uh, to farm. And uh, their farm, for some of you that might remember where the pretzel was between Port and Grafton, uh, the old interchange there, their farm was kind of on the southwest corner of the pretzel. And uh, I think now there's an antique barn there and um, Part of it's that golf course that's there, and, but uh, they kind of lost their land when they put the highway through and their land was condemned like sometimes happens. And so they stopped farming and moved over to 8th Street in Grafton. So um, finally, um, as Dr. Uh, Kugi uh, 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 said in his essay, it is 100 years later and there is peace and tranquility in the Valley of the Socha. And Mir, Slovenia for peace, Pace, Italian for peace, and peace in English. So it, uh, it was a wonderful uh, adventure for me, and uh, you know, I'll keep going back. We, we have time for some questions and answers, yeah. but do you have any final comments? Or? Yeah, I was going to mention that uh, these are, if you, have, if you like to read, uh, this is a wonderful book. Uh, my, actually, my daughter Allison gave me this book for Christmas a couple years ago. It's called The Sojourn. Uh, and it takes place in this area of the Asanzo Front. It's actually about a soldier who was uh, actually from all places, Slovakia. Not Slovenia, but Slovakia, and he was part of the Austro-Hungarian Army. He was brought to this area, uh, and he's a sniper. And it, it talks about uh, his battles along here and being a sniper, and then uh, returning home to um, Slovakia after the war. This is a movie, uh, Womani Contro. Um, this was recommended by the people at the museum in Cobra Reed, and uh, I actually bought it and uh, just watched it a, a week ago. Uh, it's a very graphic movie and uh, very depressing, and it's about Italian forces during the war, 
and what these soldiers dealt with in, in, in terms of um, you know, being told to run out in front of the machine guns, going, how, how to go out and you know, clip uh, barbed wire uh, only to be blown away. And uh, so it was uh, quite a graphic uh, movie. So.